Red Cloud Financial Services is your preeminent source for mining industry opportunities. The team provides a unique tailored marketing program dedicated to reaching the right people from its mining-focused global network, giving clients access to industry-leading events and conferences, retail and institutional marketing, plus an in-house growth-driven digital agency. Red Cloud Financial Services has access to some of the mining industry's most notable companies and CEOs. Hello and welcome to this live Copper Showcase. I'm Mark Bunting, the host of Red Cloud TV, RCTV. We have a great show lined up for you today. We're going to talk all things Copper from a macro perspective. We have uh, four presentations from uh, four different companies and in order. They are Foran Mining, Corex Copper Resources, Midnight Sun Mining, uh, followed by North Isle Copper and Gold. After that, we'll have a panel discussion about uh, the copper outlook as they see it, short-term, long-term, supply and demand, uh, the prospects for their companies uh, as well. So lots coming up. Now, in order to uh, set the table for you here, we have uh, the VP of Equity Research at Red Cloud Securities, Taylor Combaluzier. He is going to give you a presentation uh, on uh, copper. We know the Copper picture has been improving the last several months in terms of the copper price. Copper stocks have been perking up. We're seeing better economic data around the world. So it seems as if uh, things have bottomed and are getting better here. So uh, this is a timely conversation and presentation from these companies, along with the Taylor Combaluzier. Taylor, let's bring you in here and uh, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks for the introduction, Mark. Uh, so today I will tell you a few key reasons why we have a positive view on the copper market going forward. Today, copper has crept up from a 52-week low of around $3.50 per pound to around the $4.20 per pound mark. Although inventories on the LME are up 77% year over year, they are down 32% year to date. This is because of delayed deliveries from South America and Africa. Meanwhile, on the Shanghai Futures Exchange, we're seeing copper inventory that is up over nine times year to date. This could tell us there is a muted or slow uptake in the demand for the red metal by end users in China. So with the table set, I'll turn to the short term outlook. We believe that copper prices are likely to go up in the short term because of recent developments in the copper space. Here's a bit of context. Over the past year, there's been a pessimistic short term outlook for copper. However, that has rapidly changed as prices have risen based on signals from smelters in China. Firstly, smelters need more concentrated supply. This has driven treatment charges to near zero in the spot market. TCs are a key source of revenue for smelters. Charges fall when concentrate market tightens and smelters have to accept lower terms. Right now, there are supply side disruptions that are causing a su supply shortage and tightening in the market. Mainly, the closure of First Quantum's Cobre Panama mine, which accounts for 1.5% of global copper output, as well as lower output from Chile. Although leading smelters get most of their concentrate supply from long-term contracts, rapidly falling TCs cause losses for smelters that rely on spot purchases. In response to these low TCs, 19 major Chinese smelters agreed to cut output by 5-10% to at a recent meeting. Copper prices have rallied in anticipation of a looming supply squeeze for refined copper. In addition to this refined copper supply squeeze, prices are also being bolstered by positive factory data from China and the US, along with strong demand growth in the renewable energy sector. Now, turning to potential headwinds for copper prices, the main one that I would highlight is the possibility of fewer than three forecasted rate cuts by the Fed before year end. Yesterday, Jerome Powell emphasized the need for more evidence that inflation is easing before cutting. Now, before moving on to the longer term outlook, I will outline four key themes that we see that could help drive copper prices upward. First is that AI growth will boost power consumption and thus copper demand. The second is that there has been a lack of reserve growth and disruptions at the mine level, as I mentioned earlier. Third, 
is that depletion and falling, grade, falling grades at the top copper miners are also an ongoing concern. Notably, production at Codelco is at 25 years lows, while production at Escondida is expected to decrease by 5% by 2025. And Anglo-American has cut production by 20% because of low grades and higher costs. And the fourth reason is that there is potential undersupply of concentrate as miners face increasing labor and energy costs. The bottom line for why we believe there will likely be support for higher copper prices in the near term is because of disruptions and challenges at the mine level, along with output curbs from Chinese smelters and a copper ore export ban in Indonesia coming into effect in June. Taking a look at the longer term, we do believe there will be support for higher copper prices in the coming decades. We expect the, greening energy, the green energy transition to drive copper demand. Currently, greening the economy is anticipated to be largely achieved through electrification. We would expect government decarbonization targets to be met largely by the adoption of EVs. They require approximately three to four times more copper than internal combustion vehicles. Therefore, copper used in vehicles is forecasted to surge in the coming decade, essentially doubling to 6 million tons in 2031 as the adoption of EVs and hybrids increases. Overall, global copper demand is expected to increase by 82% uh, by 2035 from 2021 levels. Turning to the supply side of the equation, the amount of copper required between 2022 and 2050 is more than all of the copper consumed in the world between 1900 and 2021, just to put that into context. Currently, maximum supply shortfalls of 1.6 to 9.9 million tons are forecast for 2035. This underlines the big task of ensuring that there are that there is enough copper capacity to meet demand. Now, how can supply be increased? One, it can be achieved by bringing new mines online. Two, there can be expanding of existing operations and increasing output, or lastly, through enhanced recycling. Some of these are easier said than done. There has been a lack of major copper discoveries in recent years, despite higher exploration budgets. Only 18 major copper deposits with more than 500,000 tons of copper were discovered over the past decade. So clearly there is lots of work to be done. The bottom line for the longer term then is that increased demand for copper from the growing EV and green economy will provide a compelling catalyst for majors to replenish and grow their copper pipeline. We believe junior explorers and developers are well positioned to capitalize on this looming supply gap if they are able to make a major discovery or define an economic deposit that is. With that said, I will outline a few of my top picks uh, for investing in copper and they're in no particular order here. So my first top pick is Quark's Copper. We have a buy speculative rating and a $1.05 target price. We believe Quark's is a copper play with great value and substantial upside. Its hide project in Namibia features exceptional economics highlighted by 2021 PEA. There's also an ongoing definition drill program that is expected to unlock higher grades that should further improve project economics. My second top pick is North Isle Copper and Gold. We have a buy rating and $1.25 target price here. We believe its North Island project, located at the northern tip of Vancouver Island, is ripe for additional porphyry discoveries. Its recently released maiden 1.7 million ounce gold equivalent resource for Northwest Expo could potentially allow a low cap, lower capex staged approach to development. And my last top pick is Torque Resources, for which we have a buy speculative rating. Torque has two projects that are prospective for copper gold mineralization in Chile. We believe Torque is poised to make new discoveries at both of its projects. It is cashed up and in the midst of a 1500 meter drill program at its flagship Santa Cecilia project. We do expect news flow from drilling to provide key catalysts in the near term. To wrap things up, uh, we do have an optimistic outlook on the copper space, both in the short and long term, and we do have confidence that equities will eventually follow. And in fact, we are already seeing evidence for this as the Horizons Copper Producers Index ETF is up 20% month over month. And usually we, we see the smaller developers and juniors lag behind the bigger producers. So with that, I will wrap things up and I will turn it back over to Mark. All right, very good to Taylor. Uh, thank you very much, Taylor Combaluzier, VP of Equity Research at Red Cloud Securities with a very nice uh, table setter for us there uh, in our uh, live copper showcase show that you are watching right now. Thanks very much uh, for being with us, by the way. Uh,
Taylor also uh, gave you a couple of uh, three top picks there, two of which we're going to hear from today during this show. Uh, we're going to kick things off with the foreign mining. If you don't know, this is a more than $1.4 billion market cap company. They own the uh, very large uh, McIlvaina Bay project in uh, Saskatchewan. They also have uh, ambitious goals to be a net zero carbon emitter down the road. And foreign mining also boasts some uh, pretty big name shareholders. Here to do the honors with the presentation is uh, Jonathan French. He is the VP of Capital, Capital Markets and External Affairs. Jonathan, uh, great to see you again. Uh, I'll let you take it away. Yeah. Likewise. No, thank you very much. Mar uh, thank you very much, Mark, for the, the kind introduction. And um, and thank you all for uh, for your time today. Uh, as Mark said, my name is Jonathan French, uh, VP Capital Markets and External Affairs for Foran. And uh, I'd love to walk you through the story today. Uh, but just to kick things off and, you know, kind of talking about what Taylor was talking about, he did a, did a great job explaining the supply demand imbalances and the risk we're seeing with the copper market. It's important to really understand, you know, obviously the capital cycles, but understand where capital is going. And, you know, everyone's focusing on Magnificent Seven from a macro and, and a <clears throat> generalist perspective. You know, the NVIDIA's, Microsoft's, Amazon's, Tesla's, Apple's, you name it. Uh, and money is flowing to these companies, but it's really important to understand that the ethereal world is, is driven by the material world. If it wasn't for copper, we wouldn't have our computers, our phones, uh, our AI, you name it, uh, our Tesla vehicles, our electric vehicles. So it really is showing where the material world is so important and glow, as we grow into this global uh, decarbonized society, how much more important it's going to be. But when you look at the capital flows, uh, you know, year to date, you've seen the Magnificent Seven, the seven stocks alone, their market caps have changed by over $1.2 trillion. You know, for context, you could buy the top 50 copper producers five times over with that amount of capital appreciation. So it really shows you, you know, how small the overall copper industry is, but how important it is for all these companies to, to grow as they are. And we think over time, this capital cycle is going to switch towards the commodity side of things. And that's where Foran is really uh, engaged and excited to be a part of. And really, our core focus here is is on one sole purpose, and that's maximizing shareholder uh, returns on a risk-adjusted basis. And the way we do that is our through our three-pronged approach. It's to deliver initial production from our McElveyne Bay project in Saskatchewan. We have a feasibility study that we completed a couple of years ago, and we're looking to start construction of this later this year. As we go through development, we're going to continue our exploration strategy and really growing net asset value through the drill bit as we deliver on the production profiles as well. And lastly, um, as Mark also alluded to it, is our third prong, our net positive strategy. And that's really targeting carbon neutral production long term and really showing that there's a sustainable way to mine in this new decarbonized society. One thing, you know, Mark also mentioned, we're very fortunate to have very long-term like-minded shareholders involved. Fairfax Financial owns 21% of shares. Pierre Lassonde is also a notable shareholder at 4%. And what's also important are management and insiders own 15% of stock as well. And it really emphasizes that um, that's why we have such a focus on maximizing uh, risk-adjusted shareholder returns because we're invested alongside you and we really want to maximize the value we can get out of our projects. <clears throat> Taylor also mentioned just how difficult it is to really get new projects up and running. It could take anywhere between 15 to 20 years from finding an asset and getting it through the permitting and into production. When you look at assets that are around the world right now and the stages they're at, it's very rare to have opportunities within the, uh, you know, close to production. You know, there's over 3,000 projects globally that have resources, but we look at companies that have feasibility studies done in the last three years, over a 10-year mine life, less than a billion dollar capex, and still owned by a single asset developer with environmental permits and hands. There's really only one, and that's us uh, in Saskatchewan. As I mentioned, we have our environmental permits. We've also signed a collaboration agreement with the local Peter Ballantyne Cree Nation. And we also have G Mining Services helping us out with our with our build and arguably they're the best builders in the world. So we've really handled some of the key risks that we have in the industry, which is permitting and execution risk with, uh, with the team that we have in place. Just quickly looking at where we're located, uh, split down the middle in orange is the Manitoba Saskatchewan border. And the heart of your screen there is Flin Flon, Manitoba, which has been a historical mining camp for the better part of 100 years. So we're located, you know, less than an hour's drive uh, away from Flin Flon. So great access to a labor pool. We have rail, rail infrastructure. 
as well as in the purple line here near the top, you can see the, the proposed hydro uh, hydropower lines to site as well. So it's really one of the best places in the world to be building a mine. The other thing to keep in mind is that Saskatchewan is number three in the world uh, from a jurisdictional standpoint. And jurisdictional risk is becoming more and more prevalent uh, in today's uh, society and really understanding that, you know, the 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 law that we have in place now and the security of of you know our taxes and our laws going forward are going to be the same or at least similar over the next 20 or 30 years so when you're building a, a generational asset you really want to have a certainty of law and that's what we have in, in saskatchewan so we have over 1200 kilometers square land package but our recent targets and our opportunities have been just on four kilometers squared so in red there is McIlvana Bay, and that's where our initial phase production is going to be coming from. But over the last two years, we've been able to uncover and, ex and uh, discover the Tesla target as well as the bridge zone, uh, which really kind of alludes to the size and scale opportunities that we have on our land package and even just on such a small area. So just going underground here quickly, this is the initial mine plan for McIlvana Bay. This is an 18-year mine life based on 25 million tons of reserves. Just to, for context, uh, the total resource at McIlvana Bay is 44 million tons. So we really have opportunities to expand that mine life just in McIlvana Bay alone as we get deeper and explore this at depth. But what's really been exciting as of late has been the, the Tesla and the bridge zone discoveries over the last two years. And right now, Tesla has about a thousand meter strike length, which is very similar to McIlvana Bay, still in the early stages. But what we're uncovering is that this zone is actually connected through the bridge zone. And it's turning into potentially one of the most prolific BMS discoveries in Canadian history. So it's very, you know, we're still in the early innings of understanding our land package and what we have. We're expanding our drill program this summer into some of the regional opportunities that we have. Like I mentioned, this is all on a four kilometer square base, you know, really close to future mine operations, really, uh, you know, the IRRs of adding incremental resources is significant, but this is just a small portion on our 1200 kilometer squared uh, land package. And we continue to drill Tesla as it remains open, up dip, down dip, as well as a long strike. And one thing we're excited to be continuing to do is, is using new technologies and new ways of uncovering exploration and, and initiatives. We're, we've in, implemented TrueScan technology at site using artificial, artificial intelligence. And essentially what this does is we can get initial, um, initial assays back within a 48 hour window. Uh, as opposed to sending it to an assay lab, uh, which you need to do to confirm, but those assays can take two to four weeks. Uh, so we get a preliminary number and we're able to essentially drill in real time. And really what that does is it allows us to be as nimble as possible, save money, and once again, maximize that shareholder value. Just lastly, on our uh, third prong, you, you know, it's, it's ESG and sustainable investing isn't always going to be the most, uh, you know, uh, the most interesting thing for investors, you know, in North American investors, they're less concerned about it. But over time, uh, sustainable mining and sustainable investing is here to stay. And we think over time, this will lead to superior investment returns for shareholders. That's why we're focused on hydropower and underground battery electric vehicle fleets and uh, closed loop uh, water processing circuits, uh, dry stack tailings, really trying to build a blueprint of sustainable mining and something that can hopefully be replicated and, and really bring mining into the forefront and get the, you know, limit the brain drain that we're seeing of, of people going to the Magnificent Seven companies and wanting them to come to mining and really build into something something spectacular. And just quickly, to, I want to end off here on just the, the commodity cycles. And Taylor did a really great job explaining on the developers and, and how they do lag those uh, producers in the start of the commodity cycles. You know, if you look at your screens and if you look at, uh, you know, the techs and the Lundins of the world, they're they're performing extremely well and the, the developers are lagging a little bit. But that is usually just at the start of the cycles. If you look at it, the broader range of the cycles, developers, outperform the producers. So if you look at the developers over the last commodity cycle, 2008 to 2011, uh, they almost uh, they outperformed the TSX by almost 900%, and the developers outperformed the producers by 650%. So really, when you look at portfolio construction and looking to gain that edge and gain that alpha, you know, having some exposure to developers is critical to maximize uh, your returns and, and to potentially uh, you know, benefit during this commodity cycle that I think we're just starting to get into. Um, and that is it for me. Uh, appreciate your time and, and happy to answer any questions along the way. Thanks.
All right, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Uh, that's Jonathan French from uh, Foran Mining. Our thanks to him for his time and that uh, excellent and thorough uh, presentation. You're watching Red Cloud's live copper showcase. I'm Mark Bunting, the host of RCTV. We have three more presentations to come from uh, different companies and we'll have a panel discussion uh, after that. Just a reminder that if you have any questions or comments, you can put them in the chat box and uh, we'll do our best to uh, get to them toward the end of the show. Now, uh, if you saw uh, Taylor Combalusier off the top of the show, uh, he was talking about uh, his three top picks. Currently, one of them is coming up right now, Corex Copper uh, Resources. Uh, this is the company that owns the Hay Project in, in Namibia. Uh, we've spoken with uh, its uh, president and CEO on a few occasions. And uh, here he is now. This is a Pierre Levier, president CEO uh, over at the Corex Copper Resources. Great to see you, sir. Always a nice, colorful shirt. And uh, you're all set for us, right? Yes. <clears throat> Great to talk to you again, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> Good. So uh, I'm Pierre Leveillet, President and CEO of the of Corex Copper. We're mainly focusing on copper exploration <clears throat> in uh, Namibia and Zambia. Let me just check. Oh. <clears throat> So uh, our largest project, of course, is, uh, you know, well advanced is uh, the Hype Copper project in Namibia. We're talking of near 1 billion ton of ore. Uh, it's, it has a potential to expand, uh, you know, substantially. It's a large tonnage, low grade project. We have also uh, three licenses in which we own 51% at the moment with an option to go to 80% in Zambia. Uh, right in the middle of the copper belt, so it's uh, extremely well situated, but we're talking of a different situation than in Namibia. It's, they are very grassroots. Uh, it's important to point out that at the moment we're trading at a very serious discount to the after-tax and PV of the most recent PEA uh, on the Hybe Copper project. The NPV at $3.50 per pound is $1.3 billion US. Our market cap is $24 million Canadian. Um, of course, I will not talk a lot about copper because uh, uh, Taylor did a quite good job in, in covering the market and Jonathan also had some color to it. Just suffice to say that it's going to be the king commodity for at least the next 30 years. Without copper, you don't have any uh, transportation, you don't have communication, you don't have data storage. So it's, uh, it's a very important commodity. Uh, we, Nam Namibia and Zambia are prime location. We have a very substantial exploration upside. Uh, it's our, our project are very easy to access uh, and very near infrastructure. It's mining friendly uh, jurisdiction and we have a highly experienced management team with decades of experience in Africa. Uh, we have uh, 224 million shares issued. We have uh, $1.5 million cash at the moment. Our market cap is about $24 million Canadian. Uh, <clears throat> tech resources, uh, two institution and some uh, uh, near, you know, very uh, uh, near uh, high net worth individual uh, have about 30% of the shares, management and directors means myself and one director, we have 5% and the balance is uh, in the retail market. Uh, the uh, project IBE is situated uh, just near the border of South Africa, and you can see the uh, Orange River that is about 30 kilometers from our project. So there's access to water there. Uh, the black line that you see on the map is the road, com main commercial road coming from Cape Town, South Africa and crossing all the country. Uh, there's a low voltage power line along that road. There's also a high voltage power line about 80 kilometers east of the project. So infrastructure wise, it's very well situated. That may probably look a bit small. The reason why I want to show that uh, is that this project has always been considered as a, what I will say a classic porphyry like you find in the Andes, Chile and Peru. And it has been drilled as such. And uh, in the sense that in general, in these type of porphyries, the, the grade is fairly even all over the constraint area. And uh, so what generally uh, in the past, at least there was, uh, you know, the philosophy was to drill vertical all wide space uh, to cover and chase tonnage more than grade. 
uh, with the idea of doing, you know, preparing bulk mining. Um, what we discovered when we uh, we took over the project, uh, there's a lot of structures that were visible at surface. So it means that it may be the grade may be uh, controlled by structures, which was not the vision of the uh, of our predecessors. And so we mapped all of these, uh, you know, of these structures, and there was tens of and tens of shears fault. Uh, um, there was um, um, quartz vein, and most of them are vertical or subvertical. So when you drill wide space vertical hole, you miss quite a lot of that material. So what we decided to do is to um, map these uh, these structures. I don't know if you see it well, but uh, all the little black lines on that sketch are, you know, tens of these uh, structure we were seeing, and we decided to drill across these structures. And immediately we were seeing some results like uh, 152 meters at 0.47% copper equivalent with 30 meters at 0.81% copper equivalent. And it's like this, every hole that we pull out, it's like we, we, we really, and we infill drill in between the, uh, the existing drilling of Rio Tinto and Tech, uh, which was mainly uh, uh, vertical. So uh, what we do, we bon bonify uh, you know, the, uh, the grade, the average grade, and we certainly add a lot of value to the project at the moment. We think we will end up with a, 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 you know, an average grade that will increase substantially. I would not be surprised to see, say, between 30 and 50%. Uh, the other thing that we have looked at, because it's a low-grade project, we have looked at different uh, extraction technologies, and we, uh, we got very, very good results with flotation, rock leaching, and uh, bio, uh, uh, bio leaching using also high pressure grinding rollers. And all of that makes that we have uh, a very uh, efficient system that is highly economic. We've done a PEA uh, in, in February, 2021. Uh, we used only the indicated resource. Uh, the grade of course was 0.31% copper. Copper recovery, we, we put it at 80%. And uh, uh, we were having a capex of 340 million. Of course, since that time with the inflation, we'll probably have a capex around 450 to 500 million dollars, but the grade will be higher. So you can see that at $3.50, we have an NPV after tax of 1.3 billion and an after tax IRR of 36%. So it's very compelling uh, numbers at this stage. Briefly about the uh, Zambian license. Uh, we have these three licenses right in the center of the copper belt, which is considered as one of the most uh, productive and prospective uh, uh, copper belt in the world. Uh, we are right on the same uh, uh, geology than uh, many other companies. The one that we focus on at the moment is the is called Wenshi West, and we have done so some soil sampling. Uh, where we have identified 10 major copper anomalies and 13 major cobalt anomalies. And we have, uh, we, we, uh, we have done some geophysical survey with them and the geophysical surveys tend to confirm these anomalies uh, in the ground with high chargeability and high resistivity in some places. So it's, it's pointing in the right direction. We're now doing the interpretation of the geophysical survey and the uh, 3D model. And after that, we'll have drilling targets to uh, define these anomalies. So it's uh, we're pretty excited also with these projects. We, we may be uh, on a, a discovery path. Um, so basically, that's what we are. We, uh, we have a, a very advanced project, large tonnage, low grade. And uh, we have these very exciting, uh, you know, uh, Freddie Greenfield licenses in Zambia which is right in the middle of the elephant uh, hunting uh, uh, path. If you, if you know, we're looking for big, big project in Zambia and Namibia, or mainly Zambia is really a elephant hunting area. So that's it for me. Thanks uh, for having me on your show today. And thank you, Pierre, for that uh, excellent presentation. Pierre will be uh, joining us for the panel discussion. Uh, at the end of the presentations, we have two more to go. A reminder, if you're just tuning in, we are the, uh, this is the Red Cloud of the Live Copper Showcase. Two more presentations to go, a panel discussion as well. And you can ask questions if you like, put it in the chat box, questions or comments, and we'll try to get to those uh, at the uh, end of the show or towards the end of the show. Now, uh, up next is a Midnight Sun Mining. This company 
has a focus on the Solweza project in the heart of the Zambia Congo Copper Belt. It also has a partnership with the Bill Gates backed entity, uh, Cobalt uh, Metals, uh, which is interesting uh, to say the least. So let's uh, get to uh, the Director of Marketing and Communications, Adrian O'Brien, who will do the honors here with the presentation. Good to see you, sir. Take it away. So yours, Adrian. Think you may be think you may be on mute there. There you go. You've saved me. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> yeah, I've done the same thing. Not to worry. <laughs> okay. So diving in, I'm going to give you a look at Midnight Sun. Um, we have a, a really interesting exploration project, and as Mark mentioned, um, we do have the backing of a company called Cobalt Metals that has burst onto the scene. Um, really interesting story, interesting backers, and uh, really adds a lot to what it is that we're doing in Zambia. Um, so I'm going to dive right in here. To give you a look at our property, I'm, I'm going to show you a slide in a moment that'll give you a visual as to where we sit within the Zambia Congo Copper Belt. But it's important to understand the Zambia Congo Copper Belt is one of the top copper producing regions in the world. And it's home to just about every major mining company you could think of in the copper space. If you took our property and threw a hundred kilometer net around it, you would capture First Quantum, Barrick, Rio Tinto, Anglo, now Cobalt, of course, and Ivanhoe, um, and another company called China Molybdenum. So these are all operators. They sit between Zambia and the southern tip of the Congo. Um, most of those, of course, as I mentioned, are located in Zambia. And, uh, and this is really an area that is absolutely steeped in world-class mines very large deposits and world-class mining companies. So the property that we're working on is 506 square kilometers. Um, it's very large and we've split that up into four separate pieces. And so essentially we have four targets and four opportunities for a, for a discovery. But what makes this area so unique is that nearly every deposit and every mine that surrounds us is a billion tons. Um, so this is one of the few areas in the world where you're not looking for deposits that are a couple hundred million tons. We're not looking for porphyry deposits. These are all SEDEX deposits, and they are very, very large, some of the largest in the world. Of course, First Quantum's Consanchi mine, which is next door to us, is the largest copper producer in Africa. Um, so we have a, a flagship target that we call Dumbwa, and Dumbwa features a 20 kilometer long soil anomaly. Um, that soil anomaly has been the subject of a lot of attention over the last 12 to 18 months. Uh, due to a discovery that was made by one of our neighbors on our property boundary. Um, but that soil anomaly actually has ore grade soil, uh, ore grade copper in soil. Um, it's 0.73%. When you look at the average producer that surrounds us, they're around 0.59%. So we have this really high grade anomaly um, and all kinds of signs within that anomaly that there's something big happening underneath. And uh, with the backing of our new partner, Cobold, we're going to find out just what's there. Um, so to look at the deal with Cobalt, I'll give you a better look in detail, but Cobalt is backing us for $15.5 million. We have an earn-in uh, agreement in place on Dumbwa, so on just one of our four targets. And so the other three remain with Midnight Sun. We own those 100%. We're going to move those forward on our own. Um, but the Cobalt deal gives us uh, 40,000 meters minimum of drilling. It's going to give us a real look at what sits underneath the Dumbwa target. And uh, basically, they're going to spend $15.5 million over the next four and a half years. It's all drilling. It's going to be focused on that target. And uh, what's so cool about Cobold, as mentioned by Mark, is that not only do they have the backing of the biggest Silicon Valley investors on the planet, um, Bill Gates and his Breakthrough Energy Ventures Fund, um, which is you know home to uh, a whole bunch of big investors, Jeff Bezos, uh, Richard Branson, and, and on and on, but they have both the top geoscience team in SEDEX copper deposits, and they have uh, proprietary AI novel technology that they're utilizing to move their projects forward on a much, much more quick basis. Um, so Zambia, really quick snapshot. They are a mining powerhouse. 75% um, of their export earnings are copper mining. They've been a mining powerhouse for over 100 years. They have a democratically elected government. They have the right geological environment. They have a proper mining act in place. In short, this is an easy place to work. And that's why you're seeing First Quantum, Barrick, Rio Tinto, uh, Anglo, and all these other companies making their home there. It's a fantastic place to work, and we're lucky to be there. So here's a look at the Zambia-Congo Copper Belt. 
You have the traditional Zambia Congo copper belt over to the east, and then you have this thing called the domes region. You have First Quantum Sentinel Mine, Barrett Gold's Lamwana Mine, First Quantum's Kansanchi Mine, Ivanhoe's Kamoa Kakula, and China Molybdenum's Tenki, completely surrounding us with Kansanchi just six kilometers from our property boundary. But what I want to make really clear is that every property you're looking at here within the DRC, or within the uh, Zambia border is a billion ton deposit. Uh, so these are very, very large deposits. And of course, we are sitting here right in the middle. And that green outline is the property that we have uh, done an earning agreement with Cobalt Metals. So the big differentiator, I'll keep hammering this point home. These are billion ton deposits, not million ton deposits. So we have four targets that are sediment hosted copper deposit uh, potential. And basically we have Dumbwa, which is now under uh, an earned agreement with Cobalt Metals. We have Me Too down to the Southwest. We have Crunch and we have Kaziba. We have discoveries across our entire property, um, ranging from up here at Kaziba, where we hit 11 and a half meters of 5.7, 21 meters of 3.26. And uh, down here to the southwest where we have Me Too, we made a couple of discoveries there that were 11 and a half meters of 3.4 and 11 and a half meters of 1.5. And what's important to note is that these are not for free deposits. So being SEDEX, they're a big thick layer of material, 10 to 15 meters thick, and you build your tonnage on strike. So a 10 to 15 meter intercept is exactly what you're looking for here. Quick look at the Cobalt deal, 15 million in exploration at Dumbo over the next four and a half years. Um, it includes some cash payments, but they're earning into 75% of Dumbwa. We've retained ownership of all of our other targets, but this is going to leave us with 25% of the uh, Dumbwa target and a 1% NSR. And of course, Cobalt has to get to the end of that. They have to spend all 15 and a half million to earn any interest in that project. Um, but to touch on one of the most important aspects to us is this fellow right here. This is Dave Broughton. Um, David is uh, a very humble person, but I'm going to toot his horn for him here and, and tell you why he's so uh, sought after and why he's so good at what he does. David is one of the top copper geologists in SEDEX uh, deposits or sediment hosted copper deposits in the world. Um, he was intimately involved in both the discovery and development at Kansanchi, and he made the discovery at Kamoa Kakula, which right now is about 600 million tons, 3% copper. Um, David's phenomenal. David was hired by Cobold and will be running our program at Dumbwa. Um, he's also built a team around himself that uh, is comprised of some of the top experts in the world. So here's a quick zoom in on our Dumbwa target. This is a 20 kilometer long anomaly, gets up to 0.73% copper. There's cover across the entire property. So to simply have 0.73% copper in soil is phenomenal, but we also have vegetation kill zones along that entire uh, 20 kilometer long anomaly, which are only seen really at Kamoa Kakula and Tenki. And they're a real pathfinder to the fact that there's a sediment system underneath there that's preventing vegetation from growing. But you'll notice that this anomaly actually extends over our southern boundary. And a discovery hole was drilled there about two years ago by a major that's in the area. And that lit up this area and put a lot of attention on Dumbwa. That led to our Cobalt deal. And of course, now we have enough funding and enough uh, expertise that we're going to drive this forward and find out just what Dumbwa holds. The last piece I want to tell you about before I sign off is I'm going to move down and uh, talk about our last target, which is oxide copper. Um, we have a really unique opportunity here for near-term mining. And you hear companies throw this around a lot, but it's not necessarily realistic in most cases. And uh, our situation is very different. First Quantum is, uh, is one of the biggest producers in the region. It's the top African copper mine. And uh, their smelter, they have one of the most effective copper smelters on the planet but they produce about 1.2 million uh, tons of sulfuric acid a year. And uh, they utilize copper oxides in order to get rid of that, that sulfuric acid. And sulfuric acid, of course, is an environmental liability. And so we are currently working on a plan to develop an oxide resource across our property. And we know that we have a very large amount of oxides between Kaziba and Me Too. This is material that's all at surface, very easy to mine and very easy to move around. And so we're looking at producing a resource here that we would be able to feed to Kinsanchi um, because they are now getting very, very low on uh, copper oxides to take care of that sulfuric acid issue. We're looking at uh, solving that issue for them by providing a source of, uh, of material that they can get from close by. You know, and I just want to kind of close by saying that it's very important when you look at uh, projects right now that are coming on stream, you have to look at 
what the reality is in terms of getting these projects into production. Is the project large? Does it have scale? Does it have size? Does it have infrastructure? Is it surrounded by other operators? Do they have to build a standalone mine? Is it going to take 10 or 15 years to get into production? In our case, it's not. Um, this is a project that's exploration stage, but a discovery here means a deposit that can be moved forward into production very quickly. And when you couple that with a company like Cobalt that we're working with, we have the ability through their proprietary technology to move a project forward at three to four times the pace of a typical exploration company. Um, so it creates a really interesting opportunity to get a project to market quickly to solve that proper, that copper demand that we're all talking about today. Um, so I want to thank everybody. Um, it's a very quick snapshot of what we're doing, um, but I'm more than happy to answer questions or provide this deck and, and give anyone else a, a more thorough look at what we're doing going forward. Thank you. All right, great stuff. Adrian O'Brien from Midnight Sun Mining. Uh, we will be speaking to him during the panel discussion in about 10, 11 minutes time. Now, the uh, last but not least, the final presentation comes from North Isle Copper and Gold. This is a, a, a company that 100% owns the North Island project in BC. Uh, it also has ambitious goals to be Canada's most sustainable mineral resource company. And uh, again, off the top of the show, if you saw Taylor Combaluzzi, a VP of Equity Research at Red Cloud Securities, he gave you three top picks, Corex Copper, Torque Resources, and uh, this third one here, North Isle Copper and Gold. Just looking at the stock year over year, up 216%. It's really interesting to see a lot of these companies doing a lot better from a stock perspective and to see some, uh, uh, some rays of hope now in the copper sector after a kind of a uh, a, a tough time, a challenging time, we'll call it for a lot of companies for the last uh, couple of years. So let's bring in the president and CEO, a gentleman that we've talked to a few times before, uh, Sam Lee. Great to see you, Sam. We're looking forward to your presentation. Yeah, thanks very much, Mark. Uh, it's great to be here today. And it's, as you say, it's uh, good to finally come uh, with some results and some uh, good news uh, in a reasonably lagging market. Um, you know, we've had some really good discussions around global demand, and we're going to probably have some more discussions a little bit later on, but maybe I'll change hats a little bit, like just based on my background. I'm obviously an M&A guy. I'm a metallurgist prior to that. Um, but, you know, I'd like to put my mind uh, and my sort of my, my seat in what a board of a major mining company, gold base metals, whatever it is, would think about in terms of the future, because there's definitely a little bit of different thinking uh, in this cycle versus previous cycles. Um, so clearly big porphyry deposits with you know, a credible pathway to accelerated development still remains top priority in assessing opportunities, right? Big porphyries, 80% of copper production come from big porphyries. However, what we have seen as a real emergence within this part of the cycle, uh, this new cycle, uh, is the critical consideration, uh, including safe jurisdictions, rule of law, political will, social license. These are things, the immovable objects that are absolutely critical in bringing these projects forwards faithfully. In addition to abundance access to critical infrastructure, such as clean power, access to clean water, which is arguably one of the most important commodities in the world, uh, really do provide that low carbon footprint. Uh, this is the things that boards of big companies, big mining companies, uh, keep them up at night. These, these are the questions that they charge themselves and their management teams to think about. And the fact of the matter is these opportunities um, are increasingly more and more difficult to find globally. So here at North Isle, we are part of the solution. We've addressed these opportunities and systematically provided evidence in showing that we are one of the most compelling investment opportunities in the critical metal space globally. I will be making forward-looking statements throughout this presentation, so please refer to our uh, forward-looking statement information on this slide. Okay, so what's the evidence here? So we are a big um, copper porphyry with a massive gold uh, credit within uh, a jurisdiction, British Columbia, that is one of the safest and mo most prolific in the world. Uh, what we have is a cornerstone asset that we've defined through a PEA. It's approximately 2.5 billion pounds of copper in indicated. Uh, another 4.9 million ounces of gold in indicated. So the PEA yielded about a $1.1 billion after-tax NPV. Um, think of this as about 100 million pounds of copper production and 100 uh, 
1,000 uh, ounces of gold production a year for 22 years. That's our cornerstone asset that we have provided evidence through the PEA that exists today. Um, I think that, you know, there was a discussion earlier on around, you know, how do you define yourself? Are you a, you know, a, a large scale, a low grade project? Are you a small project with high returns, um, higher margins, lower capital intensity? Well, what we're endeavoring today at North Isle is to try to be both, right? And we are systematically, as I said, providing the evidence for, for which obviously we are getting rewarded for now. So I spoke to you about Hushman and Red Dog. That's the billion dollar MPV opportunity. That would be categorized as a high tonnage, low grade opportunity. So that's about 500 million tons of indicated and another 500 million tons approximately of inferred. Okay, so that's your billion tons that everyone seems to you know uh, trigger around as being significant. But what we have focused on over the last year, year and a half, and provided evidence over the last three, four months, is this high grade gold zone within the same porphyry, just three kilometers away, um, that essentially has margins two to three times higher than what we've defined at Red Dog and Hushimu. Okay, so we call that Northwest Expo and West uh, Goodspeed. So this is on the northern area of our tenements. And across this northern area, there spans, approximately, there spans three targets uh, that now we can say uh, host at least 100 million tons um, of higher margin rock. And then, of course, with West Goodspeed, which is on the end, eastern flank of that uh, target, um, we're doing excessive exploration around defining the connectivity of these three targets. So, as you can see, we're trying to create this higher margin, lower capital intensity uh, opportunity all within the large scale opportunity that we have at Hushman and Red Dog. And then, you know, in terms of exploration, look, I mean, I understand aspirational um, beliefs around systems and around geology and, and new technologies that allow you to advance things. That, that absolutely is in play, but we all know exploration is extremely risky endeavor, right? Uh, but we all know that the exploration can be the game changer. And so for us, Pemberton Hills is that exploration opportunity where we see a six and a half kilometer by one and a half kilometer lithocap that expands. These are systems that uh, exist in Chile and Peru. They don't exist in British Columbia. And because we are on the island, this is a very unique event, geological event, uh, in British Columbia. And we have a very, very large target named Pemberton Hill. So we've defined a 14 hole um, a program to obviously focus in on discovery. Uh, we've drilled two holes uh, so far and we're looking forward to releasing our findings shortly in the future. Okay, so uh, why have we outperformed uh, dramatically our peers? Well, I think it's because We've talked about, you know, the, the strategy was a strategy last year. We didn't get a whole lot of credit for the strategy, but we've been systematically uh, providing evidence to that strategy with resources, network, and now exploration success over the last four to six months. We're also extremely well capitalized. So we uh, are effectively owned by uh, four individuals, um, five if you include management, that own about 45% of the stock. These are cornerstone individuals that have been very supportive, obviously, in the exploratory phase of our thesis and have funded us through that period of time. And that's led by our chairman, Dale Corbin, who's obviously mine, mining hall of famers, made billions of dollars for himself and others uh, with respect to uh, discoveries and uh, like Penasquito, Michael Gentili, who's a very, very influential investor, very strong supporter, exceptionally minded individual around uh, institutional uh, approach to investing. Uh, and, and Donald K. Johnson, another billionaire that's made a lot of money for himself and others and a legend on Bay Street. And so that has brought us to the point where we have now been, uh, I guess, categorized as institutional worthy. We did an offering in December uh, with one of the largest gold funds uh, in uh, the U.S., Franklin Templeton. Uh, we obviously, it was a very uh, widely oversubscribed deal once uh, everyone understood that was our, our cornerstone investor. We were very limited in terms of uh, accept, accepting or, 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 or uh, um, uh, receiving the full subscription. We only raised six and a half million dollars, which is effectively what we need for phase one. So we are now very well capitalized, approximately nine million dollars of cash, no debts and no warrants. Very clean balance sheet, which again is absolutely critical in an environment that uh, is this um, a fickle. Uh, leadership, again, a consolidation of uh, great minds, people that have big company experience, um, have entrepreneurial experience, 
uh, and, and just great leadership as it relates to um, finding, developing, and funding uh, these types of projects. So where are we? So British Columbia, obviously there's a massive movement around uh, critical metals. And as through this slide, you could see uh, as defined by MABCs, there aren't that many critical metal projects, certainly none that have the same access to infrastructure that we have. So we are on the island, which obviously people ask, oh, we're on the island. We're on the Northern part of the island, which historically has been a very industrialized area. So once you get past uh, Highway 4 and then Campbell River, that's when you see the bifurcation of the industrial part of the island. And then you see this beautiful geological signatures that you just don't see anywhere else in British Columbia. So Port Hardy, this area, Port Hardy has been defined uh, from an industry perspective perspective by uh, a mine called Island Copper, which was a BHP mine for 24 years. Uh, that's just to the south southern end of our tenements. That's where it is located. Um, so this mine essentially built out the infrastructure, the power, the roads, the, effectively the town of Port Hardy uh, in the 70s uh, to effectively uh, uh, produce copper and gold from a similar type of deposit that we have. Port Hardy still remains. It's a beautiful mining town, forestry town, fishing town. Uh, it's got the support of the local MLA, who's obviously the NDP party whip, because her constituents understand what mining has brought to the communities and all the infrastructure that it that, uh, entails with it. Um, so if you look at our tenements, Pemberton Hills, which is the large porphyry system that I talked about, uh, six and a half kilometers, one and a half kilometers, is only approximately seven kilometers from the mine. Uh, our PEA is defined by Hushimu and Red Dog, uh, which is on the um, the second uh, northern part of our tenements. And then at, at, I guess the area of focus over the last year really has been in this northern area with Northwest Expo, Red Dog and Goodspeed all essentially connecting a trend uh, that we're aggressively looking to explore today. Um, PEA has, uh, has had a billion, billion four NPV. Uh, think of this as a one-to-one -one medium capital intensity, large um, um, return project. Uh, Northwest Expo, uh, again, we are looking to define a smaller starter pit starter operation. Uh, we've provided uh, the resource just a few uh, weeks ago, uh, which yielded approximately 50 million tons of incremental uh, uh, tonnage um, uh, at around one uh, gram per ton of gold equivalent. So this is effectively a million tons, so excuse me, a million ounces of gold and in indicated and about 0.7 million uh, ounces in inferred. Uh, as you can see, most of it um, uh, occurs at surface, uh, which is very relevant, not only from a mining perspective, but also from an exploration perspective. This area here hit grades of between, within the porphyry, between uh, two grams per ton gold equivalent to five grams per ton gold equivalent at 65 meters. And so uh, obviously that makes it more valuable rock uh, with less uh, cost associated with it. But as important, if not more importantly, it provides this exploration ability to see how where it's coming from, where these uh, hydrothermal fluids are coming from, and we believe it's coming from the south, which is going to be the era and a uh, very strong area of focus for our exploration activities this year, fully funded. Uh, strong metallurgy, we did uh, release the metallurgy in March uh, with 90% recoveries on the gold and 80% on copper. Uh, West Goodspeed, as I said, it's uh, flanking the east side of this trend, only three kilometers away from, from Red Dog. Uh, we've hit another new discovery in December, which was about 0.5% uh, copper equivalent over about 135 meters. The really interesting thing about this, which we're not actually showing here, is that these holes actually ended in mineralization. And this long hole here, it actually ended in these the surface um, or the peripheral of a very, very large mag anomaly. So this is going to be, again, a very big priority of ours um, to connect the dots between, you know, these uh, discovery holes and uh, the other two targets that we're focusing on, Red Dog and, and Northwest Expo. And then finally, this is just um, a snapshot of how big this lithocap at Pemberton Hills is. You know, if you're to map this lithocap, uh, which Codes and Amira did, uh, think tanks out of Australia. Uh, it essentially uh, ranks from a size, system size perspective, um, akin to like a Lost Palambras Batiju. Again, this is very early day stuff. This is pure exploration stuff, but this is just the third lever that we have that could, you know, uh, 
make us uh, a much, much bigger proposition. Very, very risky, but much bigger proposition. Uh, but that is not our cornerstone thing that's driving us. A lot of people that um, think about Vancouver Island think, oh, we can't permit on the island. Well, that's a very, very, very uh, uninformed view. Um, as we've shown through our very strong relationships with our First Nation groups, through consent driven agreements and decisions, we have actually got our five-year MIAB permits, multi-year access permits in British Columbia in 14 weeks, right? These permits usually take about 18 to 24 months for any other company in the province. We got ours in 14 weeks. So not only is our, uh, our area a very prolific area for natural resource extraction, um, but the evidence shows you can actually expedite the permitting process if you do have these positive relationships as defined through our consent agreements uh, with our First Nation group. So lots of things happening this year. We have uh, already shown extremely good execution, not only through juror results, but through defining the maiden resource at Northwest Expo that get, gets us to that billion tons uh, and strong metallurgical uh, testing around the proposition. So this is just not arm waving now, this is real. Uh, and then now for our 2020 four program, which is fully funded. We are going to be going very, very hard on these, these three exploration areas that are looking at expanding the resources significantly and finding that elusive uh, uh, potassic layer zone within porphyries that everyone seems to be very, uh, very much focused on. So I think that's my uh, time. Uh, thanks very much and looking forward to questions afterwards. All right, uh, great stuff there, Sam. Uh, Sam Lee, President and CEO at North Isle Copper and Gold. Uh, he is going to join us now in the panel discussion. Uh, reminder, you're watching the live uh, Copper Showcase here at Red Cloud. I'm Mark Bunting, the host of RCTV. So panel discussion will include our presenters today. Uh, we have uh, Pierre Leveille from uh, Corex Copper, Adrian O'Brien uh, from uh, the uh, the company that he is with, of course, is Midnight Sun Mining, and then Sam Lee is still here, and I believe we still have Jonathan French from Foreign Mining who kicked the show off for us. So, uh, gentlemen, I'd like to uh, start with this question for you, and perhaps we start with uh, Pierre. He can kick it off, and uh, each of you can uh, can answer. Uh, it's uh, based on the data we did see uh, manufacturing and industrial recessions in China, the eurozone and the U.S., and it was a rough go there for uh, commodity companies uh, in general. Uh, of course, we're dealing with copper here specifically, but uh, lately the data has been improving. Just today, the Eurozone showed manufacturing in expansionary mode, not uh, contractionary. So would you say that the worst is over, that things have generally bottomed, and that uh, the prospects for copper uh, we've seen the copper price get better. Copper stock prices have been improving the last several months. So is this the real deal? Is the worst over? Uh, Pierre, you kick it off if you could, please. That's, that's a good question. But the uh, uh, it's difficult to say if we're re we have really bought them. But one of the things that we must keep in mind is that it was not a very uh, deep recession. It was a very mild one. And and. That was guided by the fact that the employment, uh, uh, the employment has remained very buoyant, very strong. So when you have strong employment, if you are not firing a lot of people, uh, if you're not creating a lot of people that uh, will will apply for non-employment, you know, uh, uh, payments or uh, you know on programs, the uh, it it means that the recession is not extremely deep. So probably yes we're at the bottom because uh, uh, the employment uh, market has stayed the same all the way there, there was nothing that has changed so it may have bottom and if it's the case then uh, uh, yes we're looking for probably entering into what everybody's thinking that we're going to be in a super cycle for commodities Adrian uh, it, it did seem as if uh or it does seem as if the, the U.S. has skirted a recession, which everybody was calling for for the longest time. Um, so uh, what are your thoughts uh, uh, following up on what Pierre said? Well, I, I agree with what he's saying, actually. And I do think going a little bit further, just back to things we've already kind of covered. I think this has been getting hit on in most of the presentations. But if we haven't bottomed, we're probably getting close already. Um, you know, and I do think that the current rally in copper price is a sign of that. Right. We're seeing some proof already. Um, but if you look at the rally that sort of began in February 
And, uh, you know, that's based mainly on risk to existing supply. Um, so that's being driven by disruptions at big mines, um, that in turn forcing smelters to play, pay these incredibly steep prices. And, uh, you know, now you're seeing China moving closer to bringing about um, some kind of an output cut in response to all of that. Um, but this is about growth in manufacturing. So at the end of the day, that's what's going to keep driving these historic highs. That's what's going to keep pushing that unprecedented supply and, and demand for copper at this point. So if you couple that with kind of this declining head grades, existing mines being exhausted of supply and lack of new discoveries, it's kind of the perfect storm. Um, so if we're not at the uh, at the bottom now, I think we're close. And I think that this is this is the rally we're starting to see with people coming to grips with that situation. And Sam, would you agree with that? And the second part of that question would be, uh, are you seeing a, a, a bit of a thawing in terms of companies being able to access capital? It has sentiment uh, really shifted based on what you're saying? Yeah. So I, I think I agree for the most part, but I don't think it's worse it's worth that much, just given that, uh, you know, I thought we were going to be coming out of the roaring, roaring 20s in 2020 when I first joined and COVID was going to be just a mere afterthought. So I, you know, I think that, you know, um, to, to predict these things are very, very difficult to do. I, us as management executives of, of, of projects, we just have to figure out, you know, what we do know and what we do see and how we, that conforms to our project. And there's two things to answer your question around that. One, is, as I said, I always put my mind in terms of what the, you know, my ex-clients are doing, right? So the majors, the, the corporates and what, how that translates into what we do. Um, so one clear narrative that's been going on for the last two, three years now, and what we're seeing it happening in force uh, right now are gold companies going after copper projects, right? So this is by far the biggest shift, systemic shift uh, in our generation, or certainly in the last you know, 15, 20 years um, since I was part of the capital markets, uh, which is the gold companies are now understanding that they actually aren't gold companies, they're mining companies and their value add and their ability to become relevant in this electrification world is huge because usually these copper gold porphyries exist together. Right. And so instead of having a 10, 15 year project, they could go after a 40, 50 year project um, and, and copper will be um, a big component of that production profile. Uh, and then the fact of the matter is, I think every Hambro said it about three, four years ago, which is companies are going to be hard pressed to dig a big hole in the ground to extract a commodity they're putting right back into a vault. Right. So so that that systemic shift has really caused us to look at our opportunity, which is a copper gold project, right? It's it's approximately, it's about 60% copper, 40% gold, and we're looking to be about 50-50 after all these things uh, are done that I've just pointed out. And that makes us one of the most relevant uh, opportunities just based on commodity exposure. This is what the majors are doing. This is you know, what people believe and people do still believe that gold is a store of value. It's a, not a critical metal, it's a critical currency. And as such, you see all this very low cost of capital being deployed because there is this gold association. So the Francos and the Wheaton Rivers of the world all are doling out very low cost of capital because of the precious metal premium that they have. Uh, and so for us, that is an extremely important factor to take advantage of because we're one of the only opportunities out there that have that level of exposure, gold and copper. So for, for us, you know, we believe that the long term, um, the, the long term situation uh, around copper, absolutely. But to bridge from now until that long term proposition, I heard 2030, 2035, 2040 in some of the opening remarks, there needs to be a bridge between now and then. And for us, it's the gold opportunity because of its critical currency elements and because we've got a lot of it within our copper porphyry. All right. That's very interesting, Sam. Now let's uh, go to you, Pierre, and shift gears a little bit. Sam mentioned electrification. We know that one of the pillars of the bullish copper case is this shift to electric vehicles. Although, uh, as we've seen, uh, there has been sort of a slowdown. Is there's not a, there's, it's still growing, that market, although we have seen various OEMs cut back on their electric vehicle uh, production. So it's uh, this this isn't happening in a straight line. Uh, do, do you think that the 
Yeah. Well, well what is your view of the uh, EV market right now and, and battery metals as well in terms of supply and demand and, and the the long term the, the long term prospects versus uh, what's actually happening and uh, and the prospects for copper? Uh, first, first thing I would like to say is that uh, the, the growth in the copper market will not come only f- will not come majority in majority from the EV. EV is a component in the overall picture that has a certain uh, quite large importance, but still, you know, it's not the, it's not the only one. Um, and what we're seeing there, some many people I think have forgotten something very important. When you come with a new project, you have a very small volume and a very high price and over time you will cross and go with a high volume and a lower price and that's what we're saying seeing now is that the price has not started to get down and low enough but the the uh, uh, volume because of that has you know stayed lower as soon as the price will start getting lower the volume will pick up it's 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 a pure marketing principle that you have seen that in everything that has been marketed since, since over 100 years so at the moment the the there's not enough pressure on the price to bring the price of these vehicle down to make that the volume will pick up as soon as the price will will slow will lower down then you know, the volume will pick up and we will see a good growth again in the uh, in the eve market that's my view in a way and looking at it as a pure marketing perspective. So um, there's other areas where we see a lot of growth where copper uh, is, is, you know, a very important component like, you know, these big infrastructure projects are bringing quite a lot of growth in the, uh, in the copper market. So even if you see a slowdown in the EV temporarily, there's other areas that are picking up that are making that copper market will be uh, Will be buoyant. No, no, you know, there's no question about that. Adrian, do you want to jump in on that topic? Sure. I'll add a little piece to that. I think I think that that all makes complete sense, and I definitely echo the sentiment that EVs are a big component of demand, but they're not the entirety by any stretch. Um, there's a lot of different elements here that are going to drag the the demand to a higher level, and it's going to keep going, um, you know, moving up at a at an unprecedented rate. But one of the things about EVs that I think people overlook is the anxiety over range. So when you look at what they have to get to, to get that kind of demand that they're expecting, and it is going to be big. I mean, we're talking, uh, they're saying by 2026, one in four, right? One in four new passenger cars produced is going to be an EV. Um, 2026 is not far away. So that's pretty incredible. But unless they can get over that hurdle of range anxiety, and particular, particularly for people that live in colder places um, and that are traveling longer distances, it's an issue, right? They need to get over that hurdle. So that's going to mean, um, you know, an increase in charging stations is going to mean advancement in battery technology. And it's going to take everybody working together, whether it's private property owners that need to install charging stations or whether it's the automotive industry, government <coughs> or um, utility companies. They need to work together and they need to tackle that. Once they do, you're going to see an explosion in EVs. Um, they're going to get to the same level that everybody's always thought they would. They're going to certainly going to keep going, um, but that's what's going to drive it. And, and that's one of the last big hurdles I think they have to get over to reach that point. Sam, where do you think EVs fit into the overall bullish copper narrative? Well, it's, the EVs are obviously the end product that everybody can associate and relate to because we all need to drive. Um, but it's uh, to, to Pierre's point, it's, it's, it's just a drop in the blue, the infrastructure that's needed in order to electrify the planet, right? There's, I live in British Columbia. Obviously, today there was just a massive announcement for call to power. This is where a province where we have excess uh, hydroelectric clean power for all projects defined for the next 10 years, including ours, right? So there's now calling the call for power is today for 2030 and beyond. And just imagine the, elect, uh, the, um, the, the, the amount of copper that's needed in order to make that happen for the distribution of this power, right? So, you know, in order for electric cars to off- obviously be relevant, you have to have these infrastructure elements 
that are entirely dependent on copper. You could debate about battery chemistry all you want and technological disruption all you want, but it ain't happening in copper as it relates to the distribution of power. So that's, I think, going to be the biggest challenge uh, right now, quite frankly. And I, I, you know, from an electric vehicle perspective, you know, to, to sort of temper things a little bit, um, there is, as Pierre said, this, you know, initial um, disruptive cost that is being assumed when producing cars, uh, electric cars today, I think I heard they're in, at least in British Columbia, sorry, in Canada, rather, uh, Ford is actually um, stalling its its development of electric vehicles in Canada to 2027. So whatever it's, you know, driving that, it's probably because of some of this pricing disparity that Pierre talked about. Probably a bit of it is um, because of potential demand, people understanding there just isn't enough supply out there in terms of raw materials to create a car that is affordable to to a regular buyer uh, i don't know but there has to be a i think a normalization um around what the narrative is today because i think someone made the point earlier we just don't have enough minds in the world today to satisfy our electrification goals in the future so a bit more moderation i think actually enhances the probability of the electric vehicle um, um, motif to actually become a little bit more real uh, pierre uh, let's uh let's move on to some something somewhat uh similar in terms of uh uh, demand from a certain area, and I'm thinking of data centers now, artificial intelligence-based data centers, which we know are being built out, uh, and those need copper as well. I mean, that, that can only be a, a, a cherry on top, correct, in terms of demand? But it's 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 a cherry on top at the moment, but it can grow quite a lot because it's uh, there, there's a dramatic future to that. You can be sure of that. Even if uh, you know may, many people think it could be a hype, I don't think it's going to be a hype. At some point in time, it's very very important. That, uh, I, I'm I'm a photographer and I'm using Photoshop, and there's I, and, and there's a artificial intelligence in Photoshop today. You can imagine where it, where it is, you know, and. Uh, and the uh, AI data centers are in need of four to five times more power than the uh, uh, normal CPU uh, uh, data centers. So that means bigger units, bigger, bigger computer, bigger wires, bigger, so you need more copper uh, and quite a lot more. If you look at the old uh, CPU dat uh, data center, they need, in, in average, they need 10 to 15 ton of copper, while the new generation AI centers will need 20 to 40 tons of copper. So that's, you know, statistics that I've seen recently from the uh, uh, International Energy Agency. So it shows that AI is certainly going to be, it's, it's an interesting component at the moment of the, uh, of the copper market growth, but I think it's going to grow quite a lot to a point where it's going to be a, a very important component. Adrian, what's your view? Yeah, um, adding on to that same thing. I mean, definitely, I, I do think it's going to have a material impact. Um, you know, I just read that NVIDIA announced they're moving from copper cables to optical fiber. And the whole point behind that is they want these AI data centers to reduce their power usage. Their power usage is off the charts right now. Um, so that's a pretty giant signal right there that this is going to require a ton of copper to make that transition. Um, and I just read an article recently that the International uh, Energy Agency uses a base case of 15% annual power growth um, for all of these data centers. If you look at AI alone, that's another two and a half million tons or more of additional copper over the next few years. Um, so the demand's gonna skyrocket. As these uh, AI data centers continue to grow and continue to multiply, um, the, the drive for copper, and it goes right back to Sam's point, and uh, it goes right back to what we were talking about, is that there's all these other things that are going to drive copper demand. And uh, when you look at the energy transition, you can put AI right into that as well. Um, it's going to be, it's going to have a big material impact for sure. Sam, are you having a lot of discussions lately about uh, uh, copper demand potentially coming from, from that area, from uh, AI and data centers? Well, the, the AI data centers issue is, is similar to what the 
Bitcoin mining was a few years ago, the massive amount of consumption and computing power that is required to do these highly technically, uh, uh, you know, tech sort of driven uh, endeavors is massive. So the biggest uh, bottleneck and hurdle here is power, 100%. So it's, it goes to my initial comments, call to power is going to be incredible. I think today, you know, there was a reasonably negative announcement around, um, you know, some projects getting affected um, from an industry perspective because they don't have this, the access to power that they thought they had uh, in the other part of this world. So, um, you know, I think what governments are focused on, at least responsible governments and credible governments are responsible, uh, are focused on now, are looking 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now, on how they're going to generate this power. And when I say generate this power, it's not only power generation, it's distribution, right? And that's where the copper component comes into play, right? But the two main things, three main things that are gonna be driving the next 30 years is power, clean water, and uh, commodities that allow you to build out the infrastructure to distribute uh -huh. these things. So from, from, from my perspective, that's exactly why we're doing what we're doing, where we're doing it in a region that has excess clean power capacity, that has excess clean water. Like think about it, got projects in Chile right now, they have to build five, six, seven billion dollar desalination plants because they don't have any water uh, and they have to essentially create salt water, fresh water from salt water. We don't have that ability. These are very sort of big concept things that are happening in our world right now. It's not just copper, right? Copper is the facilitator to make these things happen. But these are massive, massive things that are systemic in nature. And I just really think that the general investor, the general public has very little appreciation of how significant these things are and how you know um, um, important these things uh, are in achieving all of these brilliant ideas that we have around electrification and decarbonization. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, clearly it's, it's, it's going to, AI is just, but yet another narrative around it. We always focus on the end product, but we don't seem to focus on these things that are going to enable all of these, uh, these, these brilliant innovative ideas to happen. So, uh, you know, I think, uh, we're in a good spot. All three of us are in a good spot. I've always believed that second half of the cycle projects are big, are, are critical in mass. Um, so we're talking, I think. Adrian talked about billion dollar, a billion ton projects. That's the threshold of size. I think if you talk to any sort of major company in the world, the billion ton is a threshold, right? Is that's kind of the the the, the limit uh, in terms of uh, in terms of size. And so, in the second half of a cycle, all of these projects, as long as they're you know faithfully, you're able to develop them, they're all going to rip. Like that's what we've seen last three, four, five cycles in copper second half of the cycle. But given we're having this discussion today, I think we're closer to that inflection point than uh, than most uh, perhaps realize. All right, great stuff, Sam. Uh, we're gonna wrap it up here with uh, uh, one last question. If we, we could get say about a minute from uh, each of you, I know difficult to condense it that way, but uh, a minute from each of you uh, against the backdrop of what's expected to be twin deficits in copper in the next couple of years in terms of copper concentrate, refined copper, uh, the overall, if you could lay out your overall bullish case and how your company uh, fits into that scenario. Pierre, we'll uh, start with you. By the overall, uh, you know, the best bullish case is just to look at the mines, you know, production depleting. So we need new mines in production and that's what will come because now major companies are hungry for for copper deposit, we see them all around the place in Zambia. They're all they're all there looking for projects. You know, majors were never looking for grassroots project, but guess what? Today they talk to everybody, so it means that something is coming. They need it, and they will need it. So, in our case, in our situation, we have a large uh, tonnage deposit that will even that has the potential to increase substantially on the, the tonnage side. So. We're certainly, a, uh, uh, let's say, a candidate for uh, you know for one of these big companies looking for uh, for a large project, for our Zambian project. But who knows? You know, it's grassroots, so uh, <laughs> we we seem to be on the path of a discovery. But uh, if it happens, who knows? <laughs> so, but with Namibia, of course, we're we're right in the right ballpark for 
for the you know what's coming with the majors. Adrian, absolutely. Um, so if you look at everything we've talked about today, there's there's no arguing the fact that this increased demand for copper is coming. So let's say we're 18 months out, 24 months out, it doesn't matter. It's coming and it's based on this energy transition. Um, it's only expected to increase from here. So if you add to that a scarcity of new discoveries, and there is definitely a scarcity of new discoveries, there's less new deposits coming on stream than there were historically, and there's few projects of scale being found. And when I say projects of scale, I'm going right back to Sam's point again, and the point I made earlier about billion ton deposits. You need that kind of scale in order to make these matter on a global, uh, on a global stage as far as these projects are concerned. So in that sense, the low hanging fruit has been picked. Okay. The porphyry deposits around the world that were smaller, that were near surface, that were easy to develop and mine, they're gone. And there's a lack of those around now. And so companies are moving towards porphyry deposits that are much deeper, much more difficult metallurgically and come with a much higher capex. In a lot of cases, a capex that actually isn't even something feasible for a small company to tackle going forward. So there's a hurdle for getting into production. That's a real challenge. So what does the market actually need? And what does the world need right now in terms of projects? We need projects that are big, that have scale, that are in jurisdictions that can be, um, that are friendly and that can projects can move towards production quickly. They need infrastructure around them. That's already in place that can then assist. So they don't have to build everything that they need from scratch and the deposits need to have enough scale and enough size that they matter. So when you take all of those criteria, you squash that down, you end up with one very short list of projects and areas where you could be working. Um, so in terms of global jurisdictions, where can you find extremely large deposits and where can you find extremely large deposits that are surrounded by some of the biggest copper mines in the world? The area that we're working is one of those few places. And, and we just heard a little bit about Zambia and Namibia. Um, and, and really the reality is the domes region of Zambia. If you look at the deposits that are there, you look at the mines and you look at the operators, all of the deposits in the region are a billion tons. You've got Sentinel, which is a billion tons at 0.51. You've got Lamwana owned by Barrick. That's a billion tons at 0.55. You've got Kansanchi right next to us. It's a billion tons at 0.66. This area is the epicenter of where Barrick is moving towards becoming a global copper producer. And it goes back to Sam's point that he made earlier about seeing gold companies now switching to copper and now realizing that they're not just a gold company, they're a mining company. And it's a perfect point to illustrate it. It's the move of those companies. And so Barrick is now doubling down. They're centering in Zambia. They're in the domes region. They sit right next to us. Their flagship copper operation is right next door to us on the West side. And so you have a region where if you're finding a deposit, the deposit's going to be a billion tons. We're not looking for small targets. We're hunting for big targets. And so you have the geology, you have the scale. And in our case, we've brought in a partner that has a unique advantage. Not only do they have backing from some of the biggest investors in the world, but they have this novel technology and AI technology that allows them to move a project to production or to development stage three to four times as quickly as what one would typically take in the past. And when you look at the competition with crypto, you look at the competition with other types of companies out there and generalist investment, what do you really need? What does the copper world need? It needs projects that can get to production as quickly as possible. And so that's a huge advantage for us having their technology in combination with an amazing geoscience team. Um, so, you know, with where we sit, if you look at our, our project, I mean, we're right next to all of those big deposits, right. we're right next to Moa Kakula. Th this is the right place to be. Um, and if that doesn't sound kind of like the, uh, the ultimate perfect storm for a big discovery and a project that can get to market more quickly, I don't know what does. All right. Great, Adrian. And lastly, Sam, uh, your investment banking background yeah. gives you interesting perspective here on what the majors are looking for, which you alluded to. So uh, last word to you, sir. Yeah, so I'll answer your questions in three points. So I'm a consensus gatherer. That's what investment bankers do. So the long term proposition, I heard six million tons of deficits. Uh, from from Taylor, I've heard, I've seen up to about 10 million tons of deficit by, deficit by 2030. The Goldman Sachs kind of number that everyone seems to resonate in their mind is about $15,000 per ton by 2030 as a result of that deficit. I think that 
analysts are, are across the board had called for a surplus this year uh, in, in copper. I think that that has now changed because of the things that Taylor talked about, which is the short term effect of the supply of concentrate not being there for the smelters. TCRC is going to zero pretty much. And then Chinese smelting essentially reducing capacity by about five to 10 percent. So that's going to have a massive impact on the uh, inventories for this year, which some people are calling for a deficit this year, which is that's to me that conceptual lock around, you know, when are we going to go into a deficit scenario? Well, we've been calling for that for the last couple of years and we haven't seen it. This may be the trigger to make this long term proposition of copper turn into a very short term proposition. That's why you're seeing uh, copper running. Yeah, I think what, just going back to gold, I think because we are now at all time highs in gold at twenty three hundred dollars per ounce. And we've been at the sustained level for about two, three weeks, certainly since PDAC. That's that conceptual lock that I was talking about, right? Like once people start to see, you know, things rebasing to a completely new all time high like gold has been, um, that's when you start to get conviction buying. And so copper's not there yet. Gold always leads copper. Copper is trailing it. And that's why I think that, you know, the fact that uh, to answer your third question, how are we positioning ourselves to all of this movement? That's how we're doing it. We're, we're, we're focusing on the gold because that's happening today. And the copper is going to happen. We all believe copper is going to happen. But the gold is happening today at all time highs of twenty three hundred dollars. And it's not only going to enable people to obviously make a lot of money on that proposition, but it's also going to enable the barracks of the world and the gold companies of the world to be more and more confident and aggression and aggressive around their conviction on their corporate strategies, which leads to M&A, which leads to growth activity behavior versus just hiding under rocks, which is, I think, what we've all been doing for quite some time now. So I'm very, very uh, encouraged uh, with these tailwinds that we face uh, in, in, in certainly the macroeconomic environment. And from a North Isle copper and gold perspective, I can't imagine a better position opportunity for an investor. Gentlemen, a really great conversation today. You gave investors a lot to think about, a lot of interesting uh, info. Uh, and uh, as, as you have uh, been saying, uh, things certainly seem to be getting a lot better in the uh, the copper sector. So our thanks to you uh, uh, very much uh, again for taking part today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Really appreciate it. All right. And thank you, everybody, for watching. Just a reminder that we'll have a replay of this up on the Red Cloud YouTube channel in no time. I'll look out for that in case you missed some of it. Uh, you can also find that on uh, redcloudfs.com, along with uh, all kinds of other uh, interviews and uh, information about the mining sector. And uh, do yourself a favor, too, and go to the uh, Red Cloud Research portal, redcloudresearch.com. Uh, this is all complimentary research, and there is a lot of uh, very interesting information on there, a lot of investing ideas. Uh, we heard from Taylor Compelluzier off the top of the show, North Isle Copper and Gold, Corex Copper Resources, Torque Resources. Those are three top picks right there in the copper sector. So uh, thanks again for being with us. We will uh, bid you uh, goodbye today and we'll see you next time.